Um, so yeah, my name is Mike Milinkovic. Um, I'm, I live in Canada, and uh, but I spend a lot of time traveling. And uh, my job, my like my day job is uh, I'm the executive director of the Eclipse Foundation. Um, but over the last two years, I've turned into a bit of an IoT hobbyist, and I have an embarrassing, <laughs> embarrassing number of Raspberry Pis and Arduinos and sensors in, in my house and in my cottage. Um, and what I'm going to be talking about is something that we at Eclipse announced uh, at uh, Java 1 a couple of weeks ago uh, about an IoT stack for Java. Now, a couple of questions for you guys. So, who here knows about Eclipse, the Eclipse Java IDE, or, no? Okay. So, um, okay, so actually, usually I have to explain to people that this has got nothing to do with the Java IDE, but if you don't know the Java <laughs> IDE, then that's good. Um, but have you at least heard of Eclipse as an open source project? Yeah, okay, so the thing to know about Eclipse IoT is that we now have uh, seven, 18 different open source projects at Eclipse that are focusing on IoT. Not, I mean, the stuff that I'm going to be talking about here is, uh, is Java, but we also have projects in Lua, in JavaScript, in Python. Um, so it is, uh, uh, if you go to uh, iot.eclipse.org, you can see quite a few different uh, things about the various technologies that we have and the things that we're doing. Most of them, the sort of the, 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 the sort of very super short description is connecting and managing devices. So when you talk about IoT, it means a lot of different things. Um, and, but what we're talking about here is primarily software that runs on a device gateway or below. Um, that's the kind of the, the stuff that we're talking about. But if you're interested in protocols, we have implementations of CoAP and Lightweight M2M and MQTT. We usually, for those, we have both client side and broker side or server side, depending on what you're talking about. So there there's really is a wealth of free and open source software available at Eclipse for IoT. Okay. Um, so is this going to work? Works better if you turn it on. There we go. Yeah. So um, everybody knows this. IoT is ridiculously big. One of my personal pet peeves is that if you read the um, press that comes out of uh, Silicon Valley, they equate IoT with wearables, which personally drives me crazy. Um, I actually see the opportunity for the next couple of years. It'll get there. Like the consumer facing stuff is super important, but the next couple of years, IoT is largely going to be about industrial applications, logistics, supply chain, all that kind of stuff. Um, it's really fun to read the noise um, from the consumer electronics companies, but at this point, it's mostly, it's mostly noise, I think. And you can kind of see this because uh, there's this thing called the Gartner hype cycle. Um, you may or may not have ever heard this, but it basically this, uh, this industry analyst company, Gartner, tracks basically the amount, the, I call it the bullshit quotient um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the technology industry. And at the moment, the uh, Internet of Things is at the absolute height um, of, the, of the hype cycle, which means that, you know, it's really got nowhere to come but down. Um, so there'll be like, next year you'll see articles written about how it's all just smoke and mirrors and it doesn't actually matter and then eventually some, some, some form of truth will emerge uh, down the road. He mentioned uh, the importance of open source. Um, I actually just wrote a blog post that was posted um, on, on um, I assume everybody here has heard of the word, uh, the company Bosch. Uh, no? Bosch? Yes, yeah, Robert, Bosch. Robert Bosch. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, well, they're inter pretty international. Uh, do, you, do you know that every cell phone in the world has at least one Bosch sensor in it? Because I didn't. I just found that out the other day. They're huge in sensors. And they, I wrote a blog post on their site. Uh, they got published earlier, earlier this week, I guess. And what I, it's not just that the Internet of Things, it's not just that open source is important to learn about Internet of Things. It is my assertion that over time, it'll take a while, but over time, the Internet of Things will be effectively 100% open source. Because if you think about the Internet, we would be, the Internet would not exist without open source. 
And for IoT to be successful, it needs to be at least as open as the internet we have today. One of the things that nobody ever talks about when you read all these articles about uh, the Internet of Things is the sheer number of developers that are going to have to be recruited over the next couple of years. So at the moment, there's roughly 300,000 developers on the planet that identify themselves as IoT developers. By 2020, that needs to grow to 4.5 million. Another number I've heard is that there's really only around 800,000 competent embedded developers on the planet. And if you talk about, just think about the sheer scale of, and the amount of software that's going to have to get built um, to uh, enable the vision that we call IoT, um, there's a huge number of developers. So open source is the way to develop, enable developers in today's world. If you look at like any, every other major industry segment that's, so, that's software, um, open source is a huge part of, this, of, of that solution. So like I mentioned before, when we talk about what we're doing at Eclipse in IoT, it's really about connecting and managing devices. Um, so, you know, the demos that we do, uh, the stuff that we talk about is all the kind of stuff that you can run on a Raspberry Pi or a BeagleBone Black or this, perhaps the sensors that are connected to that. Um, and then the management side is, it's, you know, there's protocols for connecting devices, but then how do you manage the devices? Um, and, th and those are some of the, the capabilities that we have at Eclipse. This is just a little bit of a, sort of a, uh, some of the projects that we have at Eclipse that are involved in, uh, uh, that are involved uh, in, in IoT. And that, that one in the middle, Eclipse Smart Home, I, I, I'm not going to demo it, but I want to specifically mention it because, you know, let's say you're a hobbyist um, and you like playing with devices at home. Um, Eclipse Smart Home is a really super cool uh, uh, framework and one of the, uh, for building and, and creating scenes um, for home automation scenarios. And the thing that's really super cool about it is they're related to this thing called OpenHab. And at OpenHab, they have 95 different protocol adapters. So home automation is a mess in terms of vendor lock-in. As soon as you buy one, you know, Insteon hub, then it basically everything you buy from that point on needs to be Insteon. What you can do with Smart Home is mix and match different vendors' devices, even different protocols. You could have some devices using Zigbee, some devices using MQTT from different manufacturers, but you can create uh, a full home automation system that mixes and matches these devices. And I th happen to think that that's, uh, that's a super cool thing to do. Um, and some of these other ones that we'll be, we'll be talking about um, including some of the, the protocol stuff. So when we talk about an open IoT stack for Java, actually, how many people here code, code in Java even part-time? Anybody? All right. Um, but I guess everybody's at least heard of it, right? Um, so when we talk about uh, coding in, uh, an IoT in Java, it's, I mean, obviously you start off with the, with the VM. Uh, the next layer up is this thing called OSGI. What OSGI does, do adds to Java is a modularity model plus, and this is probably even more important, a model for provisioning new applications to a device. So when you're talking about managing devices, the ability to provision new versions of technology and new, uh, or new releases of technology onto, onto a device becomes, becomes very important. Um, then we have IoT gateway services, and we'll be, we, I'll actually walk through a demo of that. Um, and for ca connectivity, uh, we don't, we're not smart enough to declare any particular protocol a winner uh, in the IoT space, but we do support three protocols today, and we're happy to add others to the mix down the road. And those three are MQTT, um, CoAP, and Lightweight M2M. And um, those, the, th the thing that's nice to know about those three protocols is in the world of IoT protocols today, the vast majority of the names you will hear are proprietary. So things like Z-Wave, Zigbee, Insteon in the home automation space, and then there's a whole alphabet soup of SCADA protocols. Virtually every industry you talk about, there is some alphabet soup of, of proprietary protocols in there. Those three protocols are actually both the specification and the implementations are open which is super important. And that's part of the reason why 
you know, I predict that over time, variations of these protocols or protocols that have a similar level of openness are going to be the ones that win. And then finally, up at the solutions, we talk about things like um, home automation, uh, factory automation. And so for those, for those uh, and so I just mentioned smart home, uh, but we also have an, an equivalent project called uh, Eclipse SCADA that has a JAB and OSGI framework for, um, for building factory automation solutions. Um, so when you talk about building an end-to-end -end IoT solution, what are you talking about? So you need actuators and sensors, you need a gateway, you need a cloud, you're, typically you're going to be putting data into some cloud and you need some user front end. User front end is either going to be something on a smartphone or something that's web enabled. You know, one of the things I read, which I think is actually true, is certainly on the consumer side, one of the enablements uh, for the Internet of Things is the fact that most people today, at least in the Western world, are never more than three feet away from their smartphone, um, which means they actually have a, a handy device um, to give them access to the Internet of Things. So sensors and, sensors and actuators, what do they do? Well, it's pretty simple. They sense the environment, and sometimes they, you can get them to do something. Um, could be as simple as turn on a light, but you're actually changing the environment in some way. So if you want to write code in Java today to do this kind of stuff, what are some of the libraries that you have available to you? So you can actually go sysfs directly. And the one that I'm going to be using here is a library called Py4j um, that gives you a nice little Java library for, uh, for accessing um, the, the GPIO and other buses that are on your Raspberry Pi. Um, or you can use something like midlets on Java ME. Um, so these are some of the choices that you have. Uh, we've actually talked, to, we're actually picking, working with Py4j for the moment. Uh, there is actually a new device library coming from OpenJDK itself called Device.io that, that we'll, probably, we'll probably switch to, but this is what we have at the moment. So some of the features, you've got complete access to the GPIOs on the Raspberry Pi. It's a mature code base that's been around for a long time. Uh, you got support for popular shields that run on top of the Raspberry Pi, and there's a nice community and lots of code samples around it. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's pretty nice from that perspective. And just like sort of the hello world example in what a, uh, you know, a Java program for Pi4j looks like, you know, instantiate it, create it, um, pin, stay, pin stayed high, turn the light on, right, and then wait, wait for five seconds, turn it off, and go away. That's the, you know, that's the simplest possible uh, kind, of, uh, kind of program. But you can see that it's you know, pretty, pretty straightforward stuff. So the next level in that hierarchy of sensors, gateways, cloud, um, UI, the next one is gateway. So, and so what does a gateway do in an IoT application scenario? And the gateway is the place where you connect the sensors to the outside world, right? So you're aggregating data from a number of, from a multiple uh, collection of sensors. And in some cases, in some user scenarios, usage scenarios, you're even aggregating the data coming from other device gateways, some hierarchy, and then there could be one that's got um, a connection out to the actual internet. But just as importantly, you've got this thing where you're managing the hardware uh, both at a hardware level, uh, but also at a software and application level. So the ability to install new versions of software, uh, the ability to tell the device to reboot itself, the ability to inquire the device about how much battery do you have left or what's your signal strength. This is all management of the device. So any real IoT application um, really needs it to have this kind of ability, especially because when you think that the, we're talking about deploying systems and devices that are going to be out there for years. Um, and so the ability to update that software, whether it's for fixing a security problem or adding a new piece of functionality, is an absolute requirement. Because these things could be on a telephone pole 500 miles away. Right? You, can, you're not, you can't send a human to reprovision every IoT device. So how, do you, how can you connect? So the two protocols that we talk about connecting are CoAP and MQTT. Both of these, um, CoAP, well, CoAP is a relatively new protocol that just got um, adopted by the IETF in the, within the last nine months, I think. 
MQTT as a protocol has been around for a decade, um, but it actually only got approved as an open specification by OASIS this week. So as a, as a formal spec, it's actually basically brand new. Um, they're, very different, uh, they're very different architecturally, but at the lowest level in terms of getting you know, little sensors talking to the gateways, these are the two open protocols that matter. Um, so what are we talking about? So CoAP, CoAP is basically a really super lightweight protocol that runs over, um, think of it as HTTP over UDP. Right, so this is, if, this is the protocol you want to do if you're, use if you're building a web of things. With IPv6, it's possible that every single one of the sensors that we're looking at here could be in some way directly connected to the internet. One of the best examples today of co-op in action are the Spark, o, Spark IO devices that come with a built-in Wi-Fi. You turn them on, the first thing they do is connect to Spark IO's cloud and that provisions the device. It's really pretty cool but your device is connected through your local Wi-Fi gateway directly to the internet. We have an implementation of, of co-op. It's at a clip called the Californium Project. A um, lot of focus on scalability and usability um, and uh, includes a DTLS, um, which is basically TLS security over UDP um, for security for, for co-op as well. Um, Co-op server, co-op resource, co-op exchange, those are the, those are the, uh, those are the base main classes that you would use. Implementing custom resources ex involves extending co-op resource, you add the resources and you, and you bootstrap the server. So the simple hello world example looks something like this. You import the class, you create the class, basically that's the hello world right there. You do a um, exchange receipt, bup, bup, bup. There you go, and you shut it down. So that's the hello world for a co-op application. MQTT is a really different architecture. So the, again, which one you pick depends a lot on the use case you have in mind. MQTT, the whole idea is that you have a broker in the middle that's collecting data um, from sensors. And the data is coming in <coughs> typically just over a TCP socket. Um, there is a version called MQTTSN that runs over UDP. And so you basically, you publish data to your broker. Um, sorry, it, the first one was sub, sub, which is subscribe. So it's a message passing style, publish and subscribe uh, style, uh, style protocol. So data gets published to a server, and then the server will distribute that data to every client that is subscribed to it. And you can do things like federate brokers, so you can have brokers uh, filtering data and sending it further uphill um, in, a in a federation of brokers. So again, you can see that that's a quite a different architecture than, than co-op. So um, Eclipse PAHO is the project that implements um, the client side of MQTT. And there's multiple implementations there for Java, JavaScript, there's an Android one. Uh, C and C++, Objective-C, Go, Lua, um, I think there's a C-sharp one coming down the pipe. So it's basically, if you have a device and you want to connect it using MQTT, Eclipse PAHO is the place to come and get it. Uh, so what's a simple application look like? Um, so I mentioned this earlier, is we actually have a, a, a sandbox server. Um, actually, we have one for co-op as well. So if you're building a device just for fun and you want to have a server to talk to, um, you're, you're happy to just come to um, either m2m.eclipse.org or iot.eclipse.org on port 1, 1883 and, and away you go. So um, basically generate the client, set the callback, you just basically, you th uh, well throw an exception if you want, but you basically, you, it's a topic and a message. So the topic, one of the things that, one of the criticisms of MQTT is there's no definition of what the content of the payload looks like, but it's basically a hierarchy of topics. So I publish things on like, um, net.malinkovich slash office slash temperature and then a value. I mean, that's the kind of things that you do. And then you can subscribe using wildcards. So if I wanted to, I could subscribe to net.malinkovich slash office slash hash mark and I get everything. On the broker side of MQTT, we have two different, uh, two different brokers. One's implemented in C and that's called Mosquito. It's, a, uh, it's been around for a number of years. It's just in the process of moving to Eclipse. And Mosquito 
is a pretty lightweight, scalable MQTT broker. Um, a thousand clients is going to consume three megs of RAM. Um, we've been running it, uh, you know, completely rock solid, stable on the Eclipse sandbox for something like 18 months. I don't think we've ever had to touch it. Um, and last time I looked, we were pumping like 32 megs of data an hour through it. Um, we don't even know what these people are doing. I hope they're having fun. Um, and then the other one is Moquette, uh, which is a Java implementation um, that uses uh, um, uh, Netty and another framework called Disruptor. Um, for, uh, so Netty is non-blocking non -blocking IO and Disruptor is this interesting new project that uh, gives you super, super fast queues. Um, and so uh, that's the Java implementation. So for what your, whatever application you want to get your broker running on. So when we talk about manage, what do we mean? Gate, so managing the gateway itself, uh, managing the applications on the gateway, and managing the uh, connectors or the sensors that you're connected to. Um, and those are all the kinds of things that, that you can do. And to, f to, do this, um, to do this, the project that we have at Eclipse, we actually have a couple of them, but the Java one, there's another one called Mahini, uh, which is implemented in Lua that works, that has very similar functions. Uh, but Eclipse Cura gives you basically a complete device gateway framework uh, and with, a, with a lot of management capabilities. And the cool thing about Cura is, you know, sometimes open source projects start off from scratch and they grow organically and they have a mix of, you know, quality or scalability. The code that's in Cura has, uh, comes from a company called Eurotech um, that has basically been working on um, IoT long before it was called IoT. And this code base is out there running smart grids and oil pipelines today. So this is solid, mature code. Um, so it, it's, it's um, definitely something worth looking at. Installing Cura to get it running on your Raspberry Pi um, is this simple. It's like, you know, type in a couple of commands, go get, go get it off the libraries. Um, you don't have to build anything. It's, uh, it's, um, so it's, it's really, really straightforward. So some of the things you can do with, uh, with Cura is network management. You can actually um, use it, uh, configure it as its own DHCP server. It's got firewalls. Um, it, you've, and you've got OSGI and system administration, so you can install new bundles or st install new versions of bundles. Um, and set up IoT server communications. It's also a collection of services. So you've got a clock service, data service, a geo, uh, geolocation service. And these are basically just pre-installed building blocks that you can use in your application. Um, so if you've got a, uh, a, a, a GPS sensor on, the, on, your, on your Raspberry Pi, you can use the geolocation service. So if the device is moving, you can actually broadcast that information uh, just, as, uh, just as one example. But the point about these is these are all pre-built services that you get included with Cura to build your application. So I'm going to do two demos. Uh, the first one here um, is just to give you a flavor for some of the admin. So as you may have noticed, <coughs> I don't have a Raspberry Pi with me. Um, but uh, let me, actually, I'll just skip a couple of slides and come back. So this is a picture of my very cluttered uh, desk in my office back in Ottawa. And that's what we're talking to. Um, so, so we're, every, like, Raspberry Pi from here to, um, uh, to the Mosquito server in Canada. Uh, well, actually, the UI here is just, is just web UI. Uh, so it's, you know, over here in the internet um, to my... Uh, over a DSL connection to my to my home in Ottawa. Um, so this is uh, the status page. Um, so you can see what's on the device. Uh, this is the the uh, uh, the device itself. Uh, it's basically, you can see that we're running on a Raspberry Pi. It tells you all the versions of the major software that I've got installed. It actually has a full firewall capability, so you can uh, open ports, you can forward ports, you can do all that kind of sort of basic network management. Um, these are the packages that I have installed, so the applications that I have installed. There's one called, uh, called Greenhouse. And then you can, um, you can uh, have settings, you can create snapshots of the uh, software that's installed. Uh, you can reset your password. Just like really basic, you know, computer admin kind of stuff. 
Down below here, now we're, now we're looking at these services that I was talking about that are pre-built. So these are things that are given to you to help you build your application. Um, the MQTT data transport, so this is, you know, this is the MQTT broker that we're talking about. By the way, you can, you can run, this is running Mosquito on a server at, at, the, at the Eclipse um, at the Eclipse headquarters, but you can, you can totally run Mosquito on a Raspberry Pi if you just want to play with this, this, this stuff yourself. Um, and then this Greenhouse Publisher is actually an application that I've installed. And what does it do? It's, well, it's basically, it's publishing data um, from my house, right? So I only have two things connected to the Raspberry Pi, which is just because we couldn't find, there's not as, as much of a wealth of um, devices for connecting directly to the GPIO as, say, Arduino. But we have a temperature and we have a light. Um, you'll have to believe me when I say that when I click on that, a, a light just turned on, but sorry. Um, <laughs> Ta-da! Um, yeah, well, actually, so uh, I saw a guy do a demo the other day that was hilarious. Um, sorry, where did that go? Where... What he did was, it, he told everybody that that was a webcam, and then he did another, then the next click, it actually, it was another picture of the light, the light turned on, and he's like, everybody's like, that's pretty cool, and he goes, I gotcha. <laughs> 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 uh, so, I, so I tried to do that, but it turns out that my picture editing capabilities are not up to snuff. Um, yeah, so that's, so that's the kinds of things that you can do um, actually, yeah, I'll skip that. Um, you can actually, um, there's some other tools where you can actually monitor exactly all of the, the MQTT um, messages that are being sent. It's a, a UI that comes from PAHO. It's actually pretty cool. Uh, yeah, so that's sort of the, the management capabilities that you've got, that you've got with Cura. So then the next thing I want to, whoops. So then a practical example, so we just looked at that, that greenhouse example. Um, so how does that actually work? So it's reading device or uh, sensor data and actuator, uh, actuator data off of the GPIOs and the Raspberry Pi. It's using this greenhouse publisher component. And if you actually look at the code, it's ridiculously simple. Most of it was actually generated. Um, and exposes a listener, exposes some configuration uh, metadata. Um, <coughs> So you can configure it through the user interface, and that's pretty much it. Um, so what does that actually look like, and what else can we do with it? So this is now we've switched over. Now this is the Eclipse IDE. And the, the, uh, so um, there's kind of two ways to deal with the applications that are running on the Raspberry Pi. What I showed you is going through the web console. The other thing you can do is you can set up your Eclipse IDE so you can work directly and remotely uh, on your Raspberry Pi from inside your IDE. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to connect to the framework. Um, this will take a second because it's got to download a bunch of data, but basically what that's going to do is it's going to give me the ability to um, hack code and deploy code from my desktop IDE directly to the, uh, to the repository. 10%? God, you can do it. Don't fail me now, Wi-Fi. Actually, while it's doing that, so what I'm going to what I'm going to do here is um, uh, sorry, is a really really simple demo, where what we're going to oh, okay. Um, so what we're going to do here is if we go back here, all right. These, these are the properties that you can edit on the Greenhouse Publisher, and we're going to add a property. And then redeploy the bundle to the, uh, to the device. And in the meantime, this has come back. So, you, so what you can see is down here at the bottom, remotely, I can see what applications and what bundles are installed on the Raspberry Pi, again, from my desktop IDE. So what we're going to do is just... Uh, I'm in the wrong file. Crap. There we go. 
So we're going to do something pretty simple here. We're just going to add a property in called password. In, I apologize in advance for my typing. change. All right, so that's, that's it. So then after we've done that, uh, I can export this as a deployable plugin. Da, 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 da. Save the file on my desktop. Uh-oh. Actually, let me, I, I think I have one saved, so let me try that. Either that or the, dev the uh, demo gods just. Uh, uh, let's see what happens if we do this. All right, so now it's trying to deploy the jar file directly to the. Uh, and it's taken a while. All right, so let's see what happens now. If we go back here and refresh. Sometimes it takes a second because it has to restart the bundle. Do I have an opinion about BLE? Um, you mean as an open protocol? Um, the best I could say about BLE is it's no worse than the rest of them. <laughs> I'm not sure if that helps. Uh, to be honest, I'm, not, I'm certainly not an expert on it, but to me it seems like the, the, like the, SIG, the, the, the Bluetooth SIG and the way that they do licensing and the patent, patent stuff behind it all sounds pretty familiar, um, but, uh, but I'm not, certainly not an expert on it. Yeah, um, I'm pretty sure like just, so I guess my demo actually broke. Um, just, but just like, um, uh, say Zigbee for example, I mean in the home automation space Zigbee is extremely popular, um, but to get the rights to do an implementation on a device, you have to actually become a member of the cartel. Um, and as far as I know, Bluetooth is, is pretty similar. So it's not, it's certainly not what I consider to be an open protocol in the same way as, say, CoAP or MQTT. If it was so I guess the demo gods are not on my side today. <coughs> no, broke. All right. Um, so just a couple of more slides before we're done. So um, one of the things I, we often get asked is how come you don't do this, these kinds of demos using co-op instead of MQTT? And the simple answer is because um, we've had the MQTT project inside Eclipse for almost two years, um, so we just know it better. The co-op one is just kind of really getting started. Um, but you, we are in the process of adding uh, co-op service uh, to Cura, so you'll be able to use uh, uh, co-op with Cura in exactly the same way that you can use, uh, use MQTT, or with the similar, with the same ease. Um, of course, for end-user interactions, I mean, I showed you that really simple little web thing. You can obviously do that. I do a bunch of other demos where I build and deploy an Android application to my tablet um, that's pretty simple. You can, so you can build Android stuff that, that reads the MQTT data. There's libraries available for that. I think there's some coming for co-op. Um, so all of that is pretty, uh, pretty, pretty straightforward to do. It's you know, typical UI kind of stuff. Um, 
So just in closing, if you only had to remember three things from this talk, um, the first thing would be is that if you're interested in this space, uh, Cura is a very complete and mature code base and has a lot of interesting capabilities and you should check it out. Um, we actually, the, most of what I did here is a tutorial um, that you can, um, you can follow. So if, and about, I'll get these, I'll make sure these slides get somewhere um, useful on SlideShare or at, uh, with OWF's website or something. Um, but most of the demo that I did here um, is available through this uh, Java tutorial. Uh, and it's right to the point of buy this model of Raspberry Pi, go to Seed Studio and buy these exact sensors. It's like the shopping list. It's literally every single thing you need um, in order to, to make this work. Um, because often, uh, you know, getting the right collection of sensors um, together can be for the right device. Um, for doing this kind of stuff is can be more than more than half the battle. And the last thing, the last key message is there are a lot of open source technologies available at Eclipse IoT. Um, I think, in all honesty, it's it's fair to say that in terms of connecting and managing devices. Uh, the Eclipse Foundation is actually, at the moment at least, the center of gravity in open source. There's, as far, I don't know of anybody else that's doing as much stuff as we are in this area. Uh, and it, these are um, very active and um, fun projects. Uh, the barriers to get started with these things are really low. If you, know, if you can buy a Raspberry Pi or two or an Arduino, um, depending on what you're doing, um, you can easily get started with, with this technology. and uh, I know from personal experience that it's both fun and somewhat addictive um, to start playing around with this stuff. So I highly encourage you to do that. And please get involved. Um, you know, there's, there's a really active and fun community that's happening at Eclipse. It's a really interesting mix of everything from hobbyists uh, all the way up to some of the largest industrials uh, around. Um, you know, com companies like Bosch and Deutsche Telekom and Cisco and Intel and IBM are in here. Then there's some smaller companies like Eurotech and Sierra Wireless and a whole lot of people like uh, Roger Light who created Mosquito that are just individuals that are out there because they think they have a passion and a belief that this is, that this is good stuff. So it's a, it's a really interesting um, breadth of experience and background, but uh, it's working really well. and. Highly encourage you to download some software, try it out, and, and please uh, contribute back. And with that, uh, maybe I have, do I have time for a couple of questions? It's yes, so just perfect. <laughs> okay. About five minutes uh, to answer to uh, all questions. So if you have questions, don't hesitate to, uh, to ask Mike. Thank you. Thank you a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I hope. Uh, so feel free to nothing? Ask. Nothing? Come on. What's your question? It was clear for everybody. <laughs> All right. Yep. Thanks, everybody. So thank oh, we got a question. Wait, oh, wait, what? <laughs> Pause. Uh, uh, how are you, are you aware of uh, of a project called uh, Ponte? And how yeah. Is it connected to the, to yep. the Paco project? Uh, Ponte. So Ponte is one of the Eclipse IoT projects. Um, it's the only one we currently have that's uh, that's in JavaScript. Um, it's not explicitly connected to Paho. So, okay, so first, what is Ponte and what does it do? So Ponte is the Italian word for bridge. And the idea is that it is a bridge between the world of sensor networks and the internet. Um, and so it runs as a Node.js application. And uh, it talks MQTT and it talks co-op, but uh, uh, on the bottom side, reading sensor data. And then it provides a REST interface um, so that you can build an, a nice web UI on, on top of this. Um, so it, it is related to Paho in the sense that Paho would be the default MQTT client that would be sending messages to Ponte. Um, and I think it might even, there might be some relation there in terms of the JavaScript implementation of the MQTT client. But uh, it's not like, there's, so there's a relationship there. It's not like one uses the other, or one, they're directly connected. That, does that make sense? Um, yeah, by the way, there's some, like, um, there is some interesting uh, stuff that we do with Node.js that ki is kind of applicable. Uh, so one of the things that, one of the um, 
Other demos that I do all the time is I have another Raspberry Pi that runs Node.js and it runs this thing called Orion, uh, which is a, a web-facing a web -facing IDE that, that runs in your browser. I have a Raspberry Pi connected to an Arduino with a bunch of sensors on it and I can hack the code and reflash the Arduino from any browser anywhere in the world, which is actually a kind of a cool thing to do. Um, so that's another thing you can, you can look at. Any other questions? Sometimes once one, one breaks the ice, all of a sudden you have a whole bunch. <laughs> no? Okay. Well, thank you. I hope you enjoyed nice. that. Really nice. <laughs>